First of all, let me uh, thank you, David, for uh, inviting me to give me the opportunity to to uh, present my work in this uh, yeah this uh, lecture series, which I uh, actually like a lot. So I went to I attended several talks, and uh, I think is, this is a um, a great uh, location uh, to meet and to hear from other theoreticians, uh, theoretical neuroscientists about uh, their recent work. <clears throat> And um, I feel privileged to also uh, obtain the opportunity to talk about uh, my work. And also let me uh, say a few words about uh, Carl. You didn't ask me for that, but uh, of course I met Carl uh, repeatedly over the years, several times. Maybe I had uh, the closest interactions uh, with him actually 20 years ago in that uh, summer school that you, David and others organized in Lesouche in France, close to the Mont Blanc. We spent there like three, four weeks. And uh, this, of course, gave also ample time to, to talk to Carl. And I always uh, admired him uh, for the clarity and um, quickness of his mind, but also for his sense of humor, right? He had always funny stories and jokes to tell. And uh, these were, of course, the jokes about the science that we did, but also about uh, when he was, for instance, an activist in his uh, study times. So I always enjoyed uh, the conversations with with Carl and uh, like many of us I always appreciated the the questions the sometimes tough questions that he asked at the at the end of these uh, lectures and uh, I hope um, some of the audience can make up for that today okay uh, with this I would like to uh, start and uh, actually uh, I would like to begin uh, to thank our uh, four PhD students in my group, uh, whose work has been really crucial for this uh, for the research that I'm presenting today. So this is a former grad student Bettina Hein, and then three current uh, grad students in my group: uh, Dayu Kong, Jonas Elpelt, and Secret Tregenup, who are all uh, very highly talented uh, grad students, and as I said, whose ideas were really uh, important for, for this work. I would also like to, uh, right at the moment, right at the beginning, uh, acknowledge uh, two uh, experimentalists I have the privilege to work uh, together with. This is um, David Fitzpatrick at the Max Planck Florida Institute and Gordon Smith at the University of Minnesota. And uh, Gordon Smith actually was a, a postdoc in uh, David's lab a couple of years ago. And they together uh, developed uh, back then uh, a very nice uh, setup, experimental setup that uh, provides basically the foundation of uh, the work I'm going to talk about today. And this setup makes use of the model system of the animal model ferret. So ferret is uh, well suited for studying cortical development because on the one hand, it has a well-developed cortex, right? For instance, it's, it's visual cortex uh, it shares many properties of uh, the cortex of uh, primates. Um, but then also ferrets are born in a relatively immature uh, fashion. So their uh, eyes and ear canal open only 30 days after birth. And so this provides then ample of, uh, of, of time prior to this important time point in development to, to image uh, activity in this developing brain. And so uh, Gordon and David back then, they uh, developed this uh, nice setup where they uh, injected uh, viruses that, that uh, yeah, led these cells to express a GCAM6, which with, with which it is possible to uh, record calcium activity, which allowed us to look at uh, activity patterns um, with a much better signal to noise ratio as compared to previous um, possibilities. And then uh, this allowed to uh, start imaging spontaneous activity up to 10 days prior to eye and ear canal opening, and also to uh, image uh, stimulus evoked activity once it is possible to do that. And um, I would like to uh, immediately uh, throw you into uh, very recent data that uh, Gordon Smith uh, and his group um, recently recorded in uh, in a collaboration between our two groups. So uh, two students, Deyu and Jonas, were also involved from our side in the analysis of these data. And uh, in this uh, work, uh, we decided to look actually at the early spontaneous activity 
around that stage uh, across the developing neocortex. So in, 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 in several areas, visual, uh, primary visual cortex, auditory cortex, uh, somatosensory cortex, and then two association areas, uh, PPC and prefrontal cortex. And uh, what we observed there was really uh, surprising to us, namely a strong spatial uh, structure. So individual activity patterns, and this is two photon recording, so you see individual cells, uh, show very uh, individual cells show very uh, spatially correlated activities in all these different areas. So uh, you see on the bottom uh, correlation structure. So basically, computing the correlation between these cells and all the other cells, and basically the red uh, painted cells are highly correlated with this cell. And you see that in all these different areas, actually, there's a strong local correlation between these cells in their spontaneous activity. So this, again, is prior to ear canal and uh, eye opening. So at the moment, there's only spontaneous activity. This is uh, uh, the natural uh, activity occurring at that time. And this activity tells us something about uh, this network structure. And we were surprised to see how uh, locally correlated that is. And quantify this as a function of distance in all these areas. Actually, there's a highly strong uh, correlation between nearby neurons, and then it drops off and has sort of a dip at uh, zero point, roughly 0 0.5 millimeters. Now, um, looking uh, at the same uh, activity patterns, but with AP fluorescence imaging, allows us to zoom out a little bit and look at a larger, get a broader, uh, larger view of these patterns, now basically several millimeters wide, and we see these what we call modular patterns of activity. So modular because we have these domains of activity uh, which have a typical size and typical spacing. And we um, see them basically in all these uh, five different areas. And uh, that is uh, surprising to us. Uh, we have previously found that something like this occurs in the visual cortex, that this is also present in these other areas uh, we uh, weren't ex ex expecting. And as you can see, um, the periodicity, so the distance between these different models in these different areas is actually quite comparable across these five areas. So this raises, of course, the question, what is the link of these endogenous model activity patterns early in the developing feral visual cortex prior to ear canal and eye opening to the developing representations? And I mean, for several of these areas, this is uh, the first time that we look at, into these areas uh, in the ferret at this early stage in development. And uh, even after ear canal or eye opening, we don't have a good idea of uh, what uh, drives these different cortical areas. With the exception of the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, we have relative, uh, it's a relatively well studied area. And we ourselves have looked at spontaneous and evoked activity previously, of course. And uh, when we think of model activity patterns, one system that immediately comes into my, our mind is the system of uh, orientation preference in the visual cortex. So when you look at the cortical surface and you use moving grading stimuli, then as a function of the orientation of this moving grading, you see modular activity patterns. So here, basically, the domains uh, of white uh, would be uh, the patterns that are activated by this, uh, by this changing grading stimulus. Now, um, we can color code. The locations uh, across the cortical surface by uh, the orientation that they get most activated by and we get this beautiful structure which is termed the orientation preference map where we see that uh, domains for different uh, orientations alternate across the cortical surface uh, this has a modular structure roughly on the same spatial scale as the model activity patterns that i showed you before so this suggests sort of that the two are related um, this structure uh, emerges or is present immediately after eye opening. So in what we call the naive cortex. So this is right after eye opening, you get already uh, orientation selective responses. They are a bit weak. The selectivity is not so high. Uh, after six days of uh, experience, actually it becomes more crisp and more selective. Uh, but still that there is this modular structure uh, suggests that maybe there's a relationship to the uh, spontaneous modular organization that we saw prior to eye opening. And there is, in fact, and uh, to make this clear, I would like to uh, first talk about uh, or transform basically this early modular spontaneous activity patterns into a modular correlation structure. And this is simply done by taking uh, a bunch of these patterns, like these are three uh, subsequent patterns, recorded uh, uh, spontaneous activity, uh, as I said, um, 
And then we take the correlation uh, pattern of, of these subsequent patterns. So basically we take one, we pick one seed point, yeah, somewhere in, in on the cortical surface, and then we compute across all these spontaneous patterns the correlation between this seed point and all other points in the location. And what we obtain are locations which are positively correlated, these red domains, and uh, domains which are negatively correlated. And as you can see, uh, these uh, correlated domains, they form like clusters which are distributed over larger distances, even millimeters away. Yeah, this is the scale bar. Uh, we can, of course, take uh, a different seed point. We get a different correlation pattern. So each seed point has its own correlation structure. And what I also would like to emphasize is that this is not so the, both the, the model of spontaneous activity on this correlation structure, it's not a property of the anesthetized cortex. So this also occurs in the awake cortex, in the awake cortex, the spontaneous activity is even uh, more prominent. Uh, but uh, the two have very similar correlation structure. So here you see a seed point from the anesthetized and awake, and you see that the correlation pattern is actually quite similar. So having this correlation structure computed uh, for spontaneous activity, we can now compare it to the orientation preference map. And this is done here. This is still in the experience cortex, so after eye opening. What you can see here is that uh, when you compare the two, uh, visually, actually, they look sort of uh, related. Actually, we can emphasize this even more. So here again, the correlation pattern you see with the seed point. And then what I superimposed here are the contour lines of the vertical, between the vertical and the horizontal domains activated by a visual uh, orientation uh, stimuli. So these contour lines taken from the orientation preference map are superimposed on the correlation pattern of spontaneous activity. So the contour lines are from the evoked activity. The pattern itself is from spontaneous activity. And you see that the two are matching very well. Right, and we are not the first. We were not the first uh, who uh, noticed this relationship between the grading evoked activity and the spontaneous activity. This has been uh, noted before also in cat visual cortex, another carnivore, uh, by uh, the Grinwald group, and later also, uh, yeah, was found in uh, in in the, in the macaque evidence for that. Now, this is, as I said, even uh, again in the, in the uh, experience cortex. Now, next, we wanted to look how this unfolds over development. So this is an eye-opening, again, comparing the orientation preference map to the um, spontaneous uh, correlation structure. But now, uh, with this new uh, chronic data across development, we can look back in time and ask how uh, the correlation structure prior to eye opening is actually related to this orientation preference map. Always we superimpose the contour lines of the orientation preference map, but we go back in time with the spontaneous correlation structure. And what do you see is that even like five days or four days prior to eye opening, the correlation structure has still has already some relationship with the structure of the orientation preference, reference map. In other words, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pattern of uh, the correlation structure, the correlation structure of spontaneous activity, um, yeah, that is evident uh, that or this, yeah, is, is it basically can be considered as a readout of the endogenous network structure is predictive of the developing orientation map, of the spatial structure of the orientation uh, map. Of course, not of what uh, domain is presenting what orientation, but the way of how uh, these domains are laid out uh, across the cortical surface. So uh, this is for the visual cortex. So there's a clear relationship between this early model activity uh, that is evident in the spontaneous activity and the developing uh, representations in terms of the representations of visual angles, so the orientation map. This is visual cortex, like how, whether there is something analog in other cortical areas, in the auditory cortex and in other uh, cortical areas where we see modular activity, I think is a very interesting question, which uh, uh, I'm curious to explore in the, in the future. Uh, for the moment, we have uh, this link only in the visual cortex and actually for the rest of the talk, I would like to uh, uh, stick uh, mostly on the visual cortex to uh, link basically uh, this early model activity patterns to the developing uh, representations. So to sum, uh, to sum up basically this uh, introduction, um, what we found is that model activity appears to be a common modular organization across the early uh, developing neocortex. 
And um, in the primary visual cortex, this early modular organization predicts aspects of the future orientation preference map. Now, these observations now raise three questions, um, which I would like to uh, address uh, uh, during the rest of my talk. Three questions about the development of cortical representations. And I would like to organize the, these three questions along this um, basically timeline of development. And we conceptualize development and we and, and many others basically as uh, considering of two um, different stages. So a first stage is basically where um, endogenous mechanisms uh, play the strongest role. So they have the strongest effect on building up uh, the circuit structure. And then in the second stage, uh, experience-driven mechanisms uh, form a strong role. And this, of course, then for the visual cortex, for instance, would be the time of eye-opening, where there, there is the largest transi transition from the endogenous to the experience-driven uh, mechanisms. Now, the first question I would like to uh, ask is about the endogenous uh, phase. And basically, we have seen that there is a strong modular organization, which uh, is... Uh, yeah, gives us a readout about this early uh, network structure that is uh, set up by endogenous mechanisms. And the question that we want to ask is what mechanisms actually produces this endogenous model activity patterns? The second question that we would like to address then is how these uh, endogenous patterns actually give rise to uh, the network responses right at eye opening that is possible that these network responses actually show already selective uh, selectivity to uh, moving grating angles. Yeah, so we saw that there is some selectivity, but we haven't studied yet the responses on the ind individual trial level. And when you do this, actually, there will be a surprising amount of tribe uh, tribe variability. And so then, seeing this, uh, the the third question that we would like to ask is how is uh, this uh, naive? state then uh, transform into uh, the experience cortex where uh, more reliable uh, sensory representations are observed. So these three questions I would like to address, and I would like to start with the first question, what mechanisms produce uh, these endogenous model activity patterns? So, um, of course, there are various possibilities, and I'm not the first to uh, ask this question. Mechanisms have been proposed to explain uh, model activity, and one uh, like class or family of mechanisms um, involves basically a feedforward mechanism, basically saying that uh, model activity is brought in by feedforward circuits, by, for instance, a particular structure of the retinal mosaic in the visual cortex and uh, that could maybe by something that is uh, named uh, Moray interference could cause uh, model patterns of activity that would then be uh, present or lead to model activity in the visual cortex. So uh, this is an example of a feedforward mechanism. Now the uh, recent findings that I shared with you that uh, show that model activity is present actually not just in the visual cortex, but also in the auditory cortex and in several other cortical areas actually uh, suggests that maybe there is a common mechanism, not uh, yeah, not one that relies on the different feedforward inputs. I mean, we cannot exclude this, but uh, the more parsimonious explanation, I think, would be one where um, there is uh, a mechanism that is common to these different areas, uh, which could be, for instance, a, a mechanism that is uh, inside the cortical circuitry itself. And there's actually a classical mechanism that has been proposed uh, a long time ago, which is that uh, there is uh, a cortical interaction, bilateral uh, cortical connectivity that has the form of local excitation and lateral inhibition. Yeah? And this goes back uh, to work at least 50 years, uh, starting by uh, work from Van der Malsburg and Erwin Trout and Cohen, and then, and, and then summarized in the book of Murray and, 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 and many others. So, and um, basically, let me use some equations to explain this kind of model. So this is a classic uh, fire rate uh, model where you have uh, basically the firing rate of an array of, of neurons, right? Uh, excitatory neurons in this case, uh, as a function of X and T. And uh, when you don't provide any input to such uh, neurons, then of course the firing rate decays to zero exponentially. 
uh, input is external input J in this case, and then uh, the input via lateral connections from other cortical locations. So these are um, modeled here by basically these integrals over the uh, cortical interaction function, mostly resulting from connectivity with the prefactor. And um, now we want to assume, as many did, people did before us, that uh, these interaction kernels are uh, have a Gaussian shape, right? Um, basically Gaussians in 2D and one for basically the excitatory inputs, once for the inhibitory inputs, which are modeled here effectively, uh, basically, uh, yeah, going from excitatory to excitatory, you effectively via some inhibitory neurons, which are not modeled explicitly here. And so local excitation lateral inhibition essentially means that the two Gaussians that are involved here, uh, that the inhibitory Gaussian has interaction has a larger width than the excitatory one, right? That basically sigma i is larger than sigma e. And so uh, in 2D, visually, this would look approximately like, like this. In every location, we have this Gaussian interaction function. It is basically a, a translation invariant. So uh, we have the same interaction function everywhere, right? Of this Gaussian shape, it's circular and so on. And when you do this, when you uh, study the solutions uh, of a model like this numerically, then you get solutions of this kind. So this shows two uh, examples. Basically, you see now domains of activity. These are the bright spots, right? And uh, they come, um, basically they form these regular patterns, regular hexagonal patterns, where the domains have a typical spacing, yeah, two different solutions, as I said. And, you know, at least uh, these models can capture uh, that we have this uh, aspect of modularity. Of course, the, the activity patterns in the cortex, they look a bit more irregular, and we can discuss after the talk how you can actually extend this model to model this. But uh, on the first order, right, uh, this modular type of activity seems to be captured by this mechanism of local excitation lateral inhibition. I should also mention that uh, related works um, have been used before to describe uh, modular cortical spontaneous activity. And here I, I cite a few of, of, of these papers. And so uh, that is one model. And let me briefly uh, discuss how this could be understood, like why modular activity arises in a, a model like this. And this can be understood uh, by uh, looking at um, First, the, uh, the steady state solutions and uh, steady state solutions which are constant in space. So when I take a uniform uh, solution, uniform in space, and, uh, and, and plug it in, basically then these integrals are simple, and then I get a solution which uh, is for, for an input that is positive. I can look for the conditions under which I get a positive solution. And then basically, once I have that, uh, the rectification I can drop because then I know that basically what's inside the rectification is positive. And then I can um, perturb, look at perturbations, yeah, like uh, spatially structured perturbations around this uh, spatially uniform uh, steady state solution. And I can um, look how these evolve as a function of time, right? And since it is all I get then an equation that looks like this. This is basically now uh, governing the perturbation around this uniform uh, steady state solution. So it's a field W and this field evolves uh, yeah, via linear equation where again, the cortical interaction functions play a, a strong role, right? Again, we have this local excitation lateral inhibition. And since it's a linear uh, equation, I can now look at the spectrum to understand what's going on. And uh, when I assume like local excitation lateral interaction, then I obtain a spectrum that looks like this. So um, the, yeah, since my uh, equation is, uh, well, the, the connectivity is uh, a translation invariant, plane waves are eigen uh, functions of this uh, basically linear operator. And so um, the eigenvalues of these uh, plane wave eigenfunctions are shown here. And what I see is, or what we see is that uh, the largest eigenvalues we obtain for a spatial frequency at some finite value. So spatial frequencies which are low, like low, long wavelengths and also short wavelengths, uh, they are uh, suppressed 
And uh, what is actually growing here is our wavelength in a, in a very uh, narrow regime of spatial frequencies. And these are basically then the modular patterns. So this is the uh, periodicity of the modular patterns that are arising here. This doesn't explain why we get hexagonal patterns, for this you need to do more, but at least we understand here why this uh, like certain char characteristic spatial scale in these patterns arises. Okay, that's the basic mechanism. And this uh, mechanism has been, uh, uh, yeah, has been uh, in, uh, in, invoked in, in, in many uh, works in neuroscience, uh, but can actually be traced back to the original work of Alan Turing, who studied such a mechanism and also with the similar mathematical formalism in, uh, in a paper that he actually, the last paper published in 1952, where he studied this in the context of uh, how uh, pattern forms in developmental biology, so morphogenesis. Yeah, so this concept uh, is basically rooted in his work, I would argue, but has been uh, actually uh, the yeah the core of many many um, computational works in developmental uh, uh, yeah in the in the developmental models for 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 cortical activity patterns in 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 particular the orientation preference map and. So there's a long list of papers. However, uh, this mechanism has never been tested really in vivo. And um, recently, um, I teamed up again with Gordon Smith and uh, a highly talented uh, former grad student in his lab, Haley Mulholland, uh, to test this mechanism because uh, modern like techniques that allows us to optogenetically stimulate activity in the ferret cortex, uh, we thought could actually shed light on whether this mechanism, make crucial tests of whether this me mechanism is actually plays a role in uh, producing model activity patterns. And these possibilities are provided by, as I said, uh, simultaneously imaging activity and optogenetically perturbing activity in the ferret visual cortex, uh, all prior to eye opening. And this is possible because, uh, yeah, this is done by uh, two genetic constructs constructs uh, that the cells uh, get expressed and uh, different lights, right? Uh, imaging activity would be green light and uh, optogenetic manipulation by a red light. So you can separate the two. And on the right, uh, you see examples of what happens when the cortex is stimulated with actually a uniform stimulation. So uh, there is maybe some, in some cases, some spontaneous activity prior to the stimulation, but what you see consistently uh, is that this opto activation actually drives activity in the cortex. Now the question, and this is a critical test of, uh, of this mechanism of, lateral ex of, of local excitation, lateral inhibition, is that a uniform drive, a uniform optogenetic drive should lead to a patterned activity output. So basically it should induce a model activity pattern. Yeah? So that's one key prediction of this dynamical mechanism that involves uh, local act uh, excitation lateral inhibition. Moreover, uh, patterns from, uh, they, these patterns form through spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? And thus, uh, depending on the noise, um, different trials should lead to different patterns. So when you do this repeatedly, you should see modular patterns, but different modular patterns. And this is exactly uh, what we found. So doing the stimulation here, you see five different trials, basically subsequent stimulation using a uniform uh, opto activation. And in each case, there is a modular, clear modular pattern with a characteristic spatial scale, but the pattern is different from trial to trial. And uh, you can go on and, uh, uh, gather uh, basically the activity obtained by many of these simulations. And uh, what we did here is uh, plotting the distribution of the periodicity or basically the spatial scale of um, the pattern that uh, we evoked. And what you can see is that the periodicity is tightly peaked around uh, a certain value, approximately 0 0.8 millimeter. And this, interestingly, is very close to the periodicity that uh, the orientation preference map in the developing ferret visual cortex uh, has. Moreover, um, yeah, when we look at um, different patterns, basically, uh, like this is 40 different patterns, we uh, quantify the diversity, you see some, and, and we 
we, we do this by uh, computing the correlation between different patterns and then sort this correlation matrix to basically group the ones that are more correlated with each other. And you see some of these patterns are more correlated to each other. There's another group here, but then also there is a lot of uh, difference, uh, like little or, or anti-correlation between different patterns. And so in fact, um, when you do a PCA, then it turns out that you need approximately 15 or so uh, PC dimensions or yeah, PC components to explain most of the variance of the evoked uh, of the evoked uh, patterns of activity. So this is just saying that the the space of op opto evoked patterns is approximately 50 dimensional. So uh, so this is consistent uh, with uh, yeah this dynamical mechanism based on local excitation lateral inhibition. Um, but it doesn't tell us yet uh, where this mechanism is uh, located, right? Uh, it could contain, it could involve basically uh, loops inside the cortex or outside of the cortex. So for that, it was interesting to go further and to do the following experiment, namely to silence um, LGN. So LGN is silenced, so the main input to visual cortex, while at the same time, uh, uniform opto- uh, activation was applied to the cortical surface. And so this doing this, uh, the result is that, again, we see a model activity patterns basically uh, with every uh, activation that is applied, um, showing that uh, these feedforward inputs from the LGN to the cortex are not necessary to uh, drive these activity patterns. Furthermore, um, one can block uh, the synaptic excitatory activity with uh, this, by, by can block this pharmacologically by uh, doing uh, this uh, glutamate antagonist, uh, quinate acid. And uh, what we find is by, uh, by doing this is that again, you get an activity pattern uh, by, that is driven from this opto activation, but the activity pattern in this case has no modular structure. So it's basically uniform, as uniform as the stimulation itself. Yeah, this shows that uh, excited, so excitatory synaptic connections uh, seems uh, necessary to, uh, to drive basically modal activity in the cortex, but uh, the cortical circuitry seems sufficient. So yeah, blocking LGN, the feed forward inputs doesn't prevent these modal activity patterns from forming. Furthermore, as a, as a last uh, thing that we tested is uh, how are these evoked, opto evoked activity patterns related to the patterns that naturally occur during that time? And these are the spontaneous uh, patterns. And what we observe is that they are very similar. So these are two examples here. These are other two examples of spontaneous and opto evoked patterns. You can see the similarity by comparing them. This is actually now the correlation patterns compared. Uh, spatial scale is very similar. And this is. Um, the projection of the opto evoke patterns into onto the PCs of the spontaneous patterns and uh, the pro the amount of variance um, that these uh, spontaneous PCs explain for the opto evoke is similar to the variance that the spontaneous uh, species explain for themselves. So this says that these two spaces, the spontaneous subspace and the opto evoke subspace of activity patterns, is really quite overlapping. Yeah. And since the spontaneous activity is a uh, precursor, basically predictive of the developing uh, structure of the orientation preference map, uh, this suggests that uh, this mechanism is actually involved in building or in the formation of these uh, orientation preference maps. So the interim conclusion is then here that uh, the direct opto evoked activity, we find that evidence that the modeler uh, activity patterns result from local excitation and lateral inhibition, causing a dynamical amplification around some char characteristic pattern wavelength. Um, but how is this mechanism then implemented in the circuit, uh, circuits of the visual cortex? Right. Uh, basically, what we found for now is basically uh, the observation that when we drive uh, the cortex. Uh, uh, when we optically activate the cortex, we will see these model activity patterns, and we found evidence that it is uh, actually located, implemented in the cortical circuitry. But how exactly it is implemented, um, we haven't discussed so far. And actually, there's a problem. Um, 
when you think about the implementation of this uh, local excitation lateral inhibition scheme. And the problem is that um, for most of the um, cases where actually the width of excitatory and inhibitory connections has been investigated, um, it looks like that inhibition is not further reaching out than excitation. So it's not clear. I mean, the data is not great that we have still, unfortunately. Uh, but at least there is no clear evidence that the inhibition has a larger lateral width than the range of excitation. And this has been noted already for uh, quite a while. And uh, there has been already in now classical work uh, possible solutions to that. Um, possible solutions that involve uh, the assumption of uh, fast um, uh, inhibition. Yeah, and this is uh, work that goes back to Ermentrout and Sompolinsky. Um, basically, the argument is that if inhibition is very fast, um, then uh, it can form a fast um, bisynaptic connection, basically involving an E2I and I2E, uh, effective inhibitory uh, interaction. That is then um, that can be then longer range in space than the pure excitatory uh, interaction. Yeah. So this is uh, possible when the um, when the inhibition is very fast. Then basically you have this you can have this uh, effective uh, long range uh, inhibition. Yeah, E two I I two E together. Now uh, the problem with this, however, and this has been noted before, is that uh, the time scale associated with the most abundant inhibitory receptor cortex GABA A is larger than the time scale of Ampere receptor at least. And as a way out, uh, it has been suggested that uh, a crucial role in such mechanisms may um, be NMDA receptors, yeah, because they are considered slower, and so uh, or they are known to be slower, and so um, relative to that, uh, the inhibitory uh, timescale could be still fast, and the mechanism could work in this way. However, in the particular case of the ferret uh, visual cortex, and we saw that there's model activity at that early stage, it has been found that uh, the fraction of NMDA relative to AMPA receptors, in particular in the young ferret, is very small. So there is more AMPA actually early on than M NMDA, yeah, making it implausible that uh, this would be the explanation yeah, for model activity in the early developing ferret. So briefly, in the next couple of slides, I would like to therefore uh, suggest, propose an alternative uh, mechanism, one that is uh, based on local self-inhibition. So here we have now two equations, similar to the, to the type I showed you before, but now I, I omit the nonlinearity and I model the excitatory population and the inhibitory population separately. And I have a term of local self-inhibition, and I want to assume that this local uh, that this that the self-inhibition is actually local. So if it is local, then this integral actually can be, of course, solved uh, quite uh, easily. And I get this term, and this term is uh, similar to that term I have here. And actually, I can combine the two terms. I have a common prefactor, and this prefactor I can basically divide through this prefactor. I bring this on the other side, and this. Uh, brings me to that equation. So I, of course, have that prefactor also here and here, but here I can observe it in the input and I can observe it in the constant. But here, this prefactor actually has an interesting role. Uh, it actually changes the time constant. And uh, what it does is uh, the stronger this local self inhibition is, um, the shorter my effective time constant becomes. So with strong local self inhibition, I can make this effective time constant uh, very small. And so basically then I should be able to apply the same uh, argument as before and uh, have some effective uh, long range inhibition yeah, via basically E to I, I to E. And uh, we explored this further uh, more systematically and this shows the phase diagram linear stability and it shows that yes, when we have a local self inhibition, even for this regime, which is on the left of this one, where actually the inhibition is more short range, the actual inhibition is more short range than the excitation. So no anatomical Mexican head. Anatomical Mexican head would be this regime. So no anatomical Mexican head with, with strong self-inhibition, we get actually a uh, model activity. Yeah? And the stronger basically this inhibition is, the stronger uh, or the larger this effect, uh, this larger the, the, the space is in this parameter. Uh, 
space, the larger the regime is in which we get model activity. Now, uh, is there evidence for local self-inhibition? Uh, there is actually direct evidence from cat visual cortex from classical AEM work, which shows that inhibitory basket cells actually form a large number of autopsies. Uh, this is cat visual cortex. And um, this could be uh, the neural basis of local self-inhibition, but of course we could also have, um, yeah, small, like localized groups of inhibitory neurons that inhibit each other. So, a second interim conclusion is then that uh, the modular activity that forms uh, at this stage where the endogenous mechanisms uh, play the prominent role, um, that this uh, modular activity forms as an emergent property involving a local excitation, lateral inhibition in the early cortex, possibly stabilized by local self-organization. So with these insights, I would like to turn uh, now my uh, uh, focus onto uh, the next two questions, which are how does this early network respond to the visual stimulation at eye opening and how is it transformed to produce reliable sensory representations? And this is now work uh, that was carried out uh, together with Seeker Dragon up and uh, experimental uh, yeah, work uh, done uh, with David Fitzpatrick and um, so what we what we did, we looked at this early stage here, right? Uh, what are the responses? How are the responses uh, of this endogenous uh, network to uh, moving grading stimuli at the time when the animal uh, opens the, the eyes for the first time? So, and um, several days after uh, eye opening in the experience cortex, let me start with this. Uh, we basically saw what we would expect, right? You get, uh, these are three different trials. So the same stimulus was presented, the same, same moving grading, and we get a modular response. And the contour lines of the response, of the first response is superimposed on the subsequent trials. And what we see that these different contour lines actually are quite uh, uh, reproducible. So very reproducible uh, trial to trial activity presenting the same stimulus. Now at eye opening, and this is actually even prior to eye opening, eyes were uh, prematurely opened. We get uh, again, very modular responses, but now the responses are very different trial to trial. So superimposed are again the contours for the first trial, but now the modular patterns are very different. And when we superimpose several, the contours from several trials, then we basically see wild spaghetti here. So there is a bias, but uh, it's actually uh, a lot of trial-to-trial -trial variability. And we can compute uh, the trial-to-trial -trial correlation, right? At the beginning, it's not zero, but it's uh, way uh, less than what we see in the experience cortex. So bottom line here is the there's, nice. there's strong trial-to-trial uh, -trial variability at eye opening. So there is selective responses, but the responses are highly unreliable yet at eye opening. And this changes with visual experience. And we can also show, we, we, we showed in, in data that I don't show today, is that this actually uh, is, uh, it relies on structured uh, uh, visual experience. So another observation that we made is uh, the relationship to spontaneous activity, right? So um, since it is, I, I showed you already that the early uh, endogenous uh, network, it predicts uh, the layout of the, um, of the developing orientation preference map. And actually, uh, this alignment between the two is very strong several days after eye opening. So here, what I show you is a projection of individual grading evoked activity patterns on by the angle or colored by the angle onto the first PCs of spontaneous activity. And you see that it's highly ordered, basically saying that most of the evoked activity, individual trial evoked activity is actually in the two main, uh, two main uh, dimensions of uh, spontaneous activity, right? And this is also seen here where basically uh, we compute uh, the variance that is explained by the evoked variance that is explained by the spontaneous species. It's almost as large as the spontaneous variance. Now this is uh, different uh, prior to eye opening. Those so projections are more disordered and, and, and smaller in magnitude. And also the overlap to the spontaneous uh, PCs is uh, significantly higher than a chance, but it's much less high than in the experience. So there is some loose uh, similarity between uh, evoked and spontaneous activity, but not on the level yet uh, that you get after uh, some days of experience. 
Yeah, so this alignment happens only uh, a couple of days after experience. And uh, one could now ask, okay, how is this alignment actually working? So early on, there is, uh, of course, modular activity of, of spontaneous activity. There's also uh, a larger, like some higher dimensional set of, of, of the worked activity. And then the two become aligned. And one possibility would be that they basically, the evoked activity becomes aligned to the spontaneous activity. This is what we would call the scaffold model. So this would in, imply that basically the spontaneous activity remains uh, static and the evoked activity sort of uh, approaches the uh, spontaneous activity. Another possibility would be that actually they reorganize and maybe they re reorganize to something that is, um, yeah, either the uh, evoked activity or something that is uh, even not uh, very well predicted by the evoked activity. What we observe is that this uh, model is actually very inconsistent with our observation because when we look at the ex at basically the experience evoked variance and how much it is explained by the naive uh, spontaneous activity, then we find that this is a uh, very little. So meaning that uh, this model, the scaffold model is highly unlikely. So what is more consistent with that is uh, yeah, basically what we observe is that the experience evoked variance is uh, better explained by the early uh, naive evoked uh, activity. So suggesting that uh, basically the resulting activity is, is closer to the early evoked activity. Still, there is uh, some amount of reorganization between the early and the uh, experience evoked activity, but less so than uh, for the naive spontaneous. So something like a combined uh, co-reorganization that leads to this uh, yeah, high alignment between um, evoked and spontaneous activity, high alignment that is uh, at the same time, um, that same time uh, shows uh, strong, uh, reliable responses. So uh, very strong correlation from trial to trial. So the question that we ask is uh, what network changes could actually underlie this transformation from unreliable responses loosely aligned to spontaneous activity to reliable responses tightly aligned to spontaneous activity? And the hypothesis I would like to uh, put forward here in the last minutes is what we call the feedforward recurrent alignment uh, hypothesis. So basically saying that the visual inputs at eye opening, so in the naive state, is maybe not yet properly aligned to the endogenous network, right? You have this endogenous network, uh, you have uh, uh, sub-networks in these networks which uh, are strongly interacting, which is other strongly linked. And basically when you drive these, network, uh, these networks, then you get highly amplified activity. But these new inputs at the moment of eye opening uh, they may not uh, drive these networks yet. I mean, how could they? Uh, these inputs are new and the cortex is not yet adjusted to this input. So they may arrive more or less randomly uh, to these recurrent networks. And uh, one um, thing that could happen uh, with experience is that basically these two become aligned, that the input then is able to drive uh, sub-networks that can be uh, impl amplified well by the recurrent interactions in the cortex. So these inputs would then resonate better with intrinsic network structure, uh, give more to rise to more amplification and more robust responses. So we explore this in a simple uh, linear recurrent network model. So this is not even having model activity. It's just a random network uh, with some uh, random input. And uh, we uh, conceptualize the feed for requirement, sorry, feed for requirement re alignment by this uh, equation, basically a projection of these inputs onto uh, the connectivity or interaction matrix. And so this basically boils down to, and we assume that the interaction matrix is uh, symmetric for simplicity. So this then boils down to that uh, input that is aligned, is input that has strong overlap with the eigenvectors of the interaction matrix that has hard, large eigenvalues. And so what we then find in this, uh, in this um, network or in this, in this network model is that of course uh, inputs uh, drive responses. And uh, when we now model the inputs uh, basically with a certain input and some noise on top, then we get responses that also uh, 
have some variability. And the variability is quite pronounced if the input is arriving to this cortex not in a aligned fashion. If there is alignment between the two, and this is indicated basically by now uh, reoriented the two, then actually the output activity in this model is uh, much less variable. Yeah. So because you're now hitting the, uh, the, the modes in this network that can be amplified more strongly, and this amplification uh, leads to a stronger, basically structured response relative to the noise uh, component. And so you have more reliable responses. Uh, moreover, so this is uh, showing the try to try correlation as a function of the feed forward recurrent alignment, and you see that it goes up. Moreover, we can also in this simple framework uh, conceptualize spontaneous activities. So modeling spontaneous activity basically as broad, unspecific input to this recurrent network. And um, this basically the recurrent network transforms this incoming uh, broad spontaneous input to uh, an output activity that is lower dimensional than the input. This is via the recurrent connections, right? And in fact, uh, it shows that uh, the alignment uh, of evoked activity to spontaneous activity is large, in particular when, this, when these inputs have now a strong feedback recurrent alignment. So it's almost a necessary condition you need a relatively strong uh, feed forward recurrent alignment of inputs in order to align to spontaneous activity. So this model then suggests that um, what we see in the cortex and the naive state is maybe input that is not aligned yet to the recurrent cortex, leading to responses that are unreliable and also that are not aligned yet to spontaneous activity. And then that what changes uh, during development in the next couple of days with experience is that these inputs become more aligned to drive the main response modes such that the, and, and this has a consequence that the responses are more uh, reproducible, try to try, they're more reliable, and also they are more aligned to the spontaneous activity patterns. So that can uh, explain in principle these two observations that we have. Now, the last point I would like to make, I'm uh, almost finished, a couple of slides, is a critical test of this uh, yeah, conceptual modeling framework. So if this were true, then we should be able to use the optogenetic framework that I introduced uh, previously in this talk by testing basically this, by driving using uh, optogenetic stimulation to either drive uh, the uh, basically drive endogenous patterns, so patterns that occur during spontaneous activity in the cortex and compare this to uh, artificial patterns that basically have no relationship to the endogenous spontaneous activity. So on the left-hand side, using this simulation that matches the endogenous activity patterns, we should see more reliable, stronger responses, while on the right-hand side, uh, we should see less reliable and uh, stronger responses. And um, so uh, basically to implement this idea, uh, yeah, uh, Haley and uh, Gordon uh, thought about a closed loop experiment where they image a spontaneous activity first and then find the endogenous, the spontaneous activity patterns, and then create on the fly a stimulus mask that either matches or doesn't match this endogenous activity patterns. Yeah, structured optogenetic simulation. And the result that uh, they observed was that uh, when you use endogenous patterns, you get a, a reasonable try-to-trial uh, variability, try-to-trial correlation. So this is uh, the correlation between different trials, something like 30 in total. This is a different pattern. Again, the correlation between different trials, right? Um, this is the correlation across trials. And when you compare this to random patterns, that you see that random patterns have a lower try-to-trial correlation. You quantify this. Now, uh, this is the difference here between uh, opto-activating endogenous patterns or random patterns. You can also activate random patterns with different uh, spatial scale, right? This is the, the random pattern that would match the endogenous spatial scale. But bottom line is that, in fact, as our um, feedforward recurrent alignment uh, model would predict, activating the cortex with uh, patterns that uh, are basically in line with the core spontaneous activity patterns, you get a more reliable response than uh, random patterns. 
So uh, this brings me uh, to an end of this part, where basically we showed that uh, in the chronic imaging uh, shows that diverse modular patterns loosely related to spontaneous patterns, while uh, with experience, there is a compact set of modular patterns that are highly aligned with spontaneous uh, patterns. And then the model that I, uh, that I introduced suggests or proposes the hypothesis that uh, recurrent alignment could be a major factor in going from basically these unreliable responses to the reliable responses. And I also presented uh, an experimental test uh, based on recurrent amplification of aligned inputs, showing that inputs into the cortex that overlap with endogenous network patterns drive more reliable and specific responses. So let me quickly wrap up the entire talk. So uh, basically three uh, co main conclusions. First of all, um, we found that model activity forms as an emergent property in the early cortex, possibly stabilized by local self-inhibition. Initial responses of endogenous network to visual stimulation is highly diverse and uh, unreliable. And uh, the representations become reliable through what we believe is a major factor of feedforward recurrent alignment. And with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, the people who have been, of course, uh, very crucial for this work. Uh, these are uh, PhD students and postdoc in my lab, especially Jonas Alpelt, uh, Bettina Hein, Dei Kong, and Sigurd Dregenab were involved in, uh, in the work that I presented today. And I want to, again, also thank uh, the two amazing experimental collaborators. I'm privileged to work together with David Fitzpatrick and Gordon Smith, without whom these all would not be possible. And also thank my funding sources and you for your attention.